When we look up at the stars, it's humbling to realize we are only getting a peek at what's up there, that way beyond what's visible to the naked eye lie wondrous galaxies we never knew existed until the Hubble Space Telescope. For 27 years since it was launched into space, Hubble has been sending us stunning images of the vast heavens. Over the years, astronauts have repeatedly upgraded Hubble, so its most dramatic discoveries have come recently. Tonight, we'll take you up to Hubble and billions of light years beyond to see some of its latest, most spectacular revelations. NASA celebrates Hubble's birthday each year by giving us a gift, a new, breathtaking view of our universe. The latest birthday card? This elegant swirl of galaxies dancing in tandem deep in space. Last year, this bubble of stellar gases floating among the stars like a diaphanous cosmic jellyfish. Hubble has shown us radiant, rose-shaped galaxies stretching across deep space, and dramatic, towering clouds of gas teeming with the stuff of creation. Stars are born here. Year after year, in the infinite black canvas overhead, Hubble paints an ever-expanding picture of our universe, an awe-inspiring light show for us to admire and for scientists to study. I believe Hubble has been the single most transformative scientific instrument that we've ever built. Most transformative, says NASA astrophysicist Amber Strawn, because Hubble keeps improving our understanding of the universe. She showed us what Hubble discovered after staring for days into what seemed to be an empty black patch, a deep, dark void in outer space. The original Hubble Deep Field is located um, just above the Big Dipper. It's a part of the sky that most people are familiar with. It's a blank piece of sky. So just nothing in here, just darkness. Nothing at all, complete darkness. And then when we look at it with Hubble, what we see is thousands of galaxies. Not just stars, right. galaxies. Galaxies outside of our own, something we never imagined. Is it that Hubble just stares into that dark spot until the light penetrates and reveals itself? That's exactly what happens. It's sometimes many, many, many days of just staring at one part of the sky and allowing the photons to collect on your detector. And this is what's revealed. And this is what's revealed. But Hubble was just warming up. That was 22 years ago. Since then, Hubble has stared deeper and longer into space with enhanced equipment. In this particular image, there are 10,000 galaxies. So every single point of light is an individual galaxy, its own little island universe. And so this is a real visualization of the distances of these galaxies. So it's sort, sort of, of like 3D. 3D, like we're flying through. So we can make these images 3D because we know how far away the galaxies are. What Hubble has essentially given us is the size of the universe. Hubble has taught us that the universe is filled with hundreds of billions of other galaxies. And now the latest analysis of Hubble's data reveals there could be more than two trillion galaxies, ten times more than previously thought. Typical galaxies, like our Milky Way, have 100 billion stars. That means the total number of stars or suns out there is two followed by 23 zeros. That's called 200 sextillion. To get some sense of how many stars that is, we went to Adam Rees, who won a Nobel Prize for his work on Hubble. This is more stars in the visible universe than grains of sand on the beach. And on Earth. On Earth. all the beaches on Earth. And Hubble has shown us this? It has. In many cases, it has allowed us to see what some of the most distant galaxies look like and how many stars were in them, and we've been able to add it all up. Hubble has been called a time machine that it looks back in time? What has been the most astounding part of that for you? I study uh, explosions of stars called supernovae. It's like fireworks. It's only visible for a short period of time, in this case, a few weeks. And that light has been traveling to us for 10 billion years. It began its journey when the Earth wasn't even here. And over those 10 billion years, our planet formed, life developed, we built a Hubble Space Telescope, we opened the aperture door, and in the last one billionth of one percent of that journey that the light made, we opened the door just in time to catch it. 
Hubble almost didn't catch anything. The first pictures it sent back were blurry because of a microscopic flaw in the mirror. The space agency launched a daring mission to fix it. Astronauts have made five trips to Hubble to repair and upgrade its equipment. Hey, John, you can open the thermal cover. John Grunsfeld, known as the Hubble repairman, flew three of those missions to a telescope the size of a school bus orbiting 300 miles above Earth. Just about anything that we can easily change and upgrade and fix has been fixed. The workings of the telescope, all of that has been transformed. Yep. It is like a new telescope. On your last mission, you come out of the airlock and uh, you've got this big smile on your face. I thought, you know, I can't imagine anywhere I'd rather be than outside the space shuttle in my spacesuit next to the Hubble Space Telescope. I was just so happy. Hubble has changed what we know about the universe, its structure, evolution, its age, 13.8 billion years. Hubble showed us the marvel and majesty of stars being born. This is a region of gas and dust that's churning up new baby stars. And now we've learned with Hubble not only stars, but also baby planet systems. Most of these stars have planets going around them? Most stars actually do have planets. Uh, when I was a kid, we only knew of the planets inside our solar system. And now we know that the planets are absolutely everywhere. Astronomer Heidi Hamill specializes in Hubble's work within our solar system. With the telescope, she saw huge fragments of a comet slam into Jupiter, creating giant impacts. When I first heard that a comet was going to hit Jupiter, my reaction was, eh, so what? Jupiter's huge, comets are small. And so when I saw the first impact site, and it was huge and dark, I was flabbergasted. This is where the comet has smacked into the planet at such a high velocity that it's caused an explosion, the equivalent of many, many millions of atomic bombs. The Earth is the size of that ring. And so if this event had happened on Earth... We're gone. Yeah, we, we call that a biosphere changing event, <laughs> which basically means we'd be gone. Hubble orbits high outside Earth's atmosphere, so it can see a wide spectrum of light our atmosphere blocks. Beyond Earth's protective layer, Hubble's ultraviolet camera can spot dazzling displays like this glowing halo on top of Jupiter. Up in the northern hemisphere, what you're seeing is the glowing aurora. An aurora happens when the planet's magnetic field has charged particles that interact with the upper atmosphere. What you're seeing there is actually charged particles from the sun. They get swept up in Jupiter's strong magnetic field, and then it's mirrored in that shimmering that you see inside the auroral oval. And, and you would not be able to see that with an Earth telescope? You could never see those aurora because our atmosphere has an ozone layer that absorbs the ultraviolet light. Hubble also found a similar blue hue at the bottom of Saturn. The telescope's most iconic picture is this, the Pillars of Creation, a stellar breeding place. Amber Strawn showed us what a difference Hubble's upgraded infrared camera made just two years ago. Stars are born inside these dust clouds. And this is going to give you a clue on why infrared is so important. It's because in infrared light, what you see is the stars you can inside. see the stars inside. Look shining at that. through. How big is this cloud area? Top to bottom, these pillars are about 10 light years, which is about 60 trillion miles. 60 trillion miles. Yes. Space is big. <laughs> big and miraculous with constant celestial regeneration. Strawn calls this the everything picture because you can see old stars blowing up and new stars forming. Anytime you see these sort of dark, cloudy regions, you can imagine that there's stars being born inside there. 
But where are the dying stars? And the dying stars, we think that this one could explode any day, literally, or it could be a thousand years from now, but near, near term in, in astronomers' times. In cosmic time, times. any day. Right. So big stars, when they die, they explode and send their contents into the surrounding universe. And these contents are what seed future stars and future planets and help to seed life, ultimately. The iron in your blood and the calcium in your bones was literally forged inside of a star that ended its life like this. So we are all stardust. We literally are stardust. We are viscerally made of the stars. One of the things I think is remarkable about this image is it shows you how colorful the universe is. This looks like contemporary art. This is a very tightly bound group of stars. And what you see here is about 100,000 stars. This was one of the first images that Hubble's new camera installed in 2009. This was one of the first images it took. Blue stars are the youngest and hottest. White and yellow stars, like our sun, are midlife, while red stars are the oldest and coolest. Uh, what a beautiful view. John Grunsfeld has a cool claim to fame. He's the last human to touch Hubble. He gave it a farewell pat. Hubble was planned to live for 15 years. It's now been 27. How much longer can Hubble go? I'm reasonably confident it will continue another three to five years. That means for a while at least, Hubble will work in tandem with its successor, the much larger James Webb Telescope, scheduled to launch in 2019. Webb should be able to detect light from the very earliest galaxies. The farthest back Hubble can see is this red blob, a galaxy from 400 million years after the Big Bang. Webb should take us much closer to the beginning of time. So the James Webb Space Telescope was specifically designed to see the first stars and galaxies that were formed in the universe. So we're going to see the snapshot of when stars started, when galaxies started, the very first moments of the universe. And my bet there's going to be some big surprises. How many planets are there? Nine is what we were taught. But as telescopes get stronger and astronomers learn more about our solar system, long accepted facts become fallacies. Pluto had been considered a planet for 76 years, but Pluto lost its planet status after an astronomer at Caltech discovered that Pluto wasn't so special after all. His name is Mike Brown. Brown and other astronomers have since found hundreds of large balls of ice like Pluto circling the sun at the far reaches of our solar system. Demoting Pluto leaves us with eight planets, but Mike Brown is preparing another surprise. He is sure there is a real ninth planet way out far beyond Pluto. He hasn't seen it yet, but he expects too soon. He believes the real Planet Nine is huge, and it's out there. I would say at this point, I am certain. Certain, yeah. That's a rare thing to say for a prediction for a scientist, and I'm willing to say it. You do know how mind-boggling this sounds. I mean, a new planet hasn't been discovered for... 170 years. I believe you think it looks like this animation over my shoulder here. You know, we took a little artistic license and put some lightning on the dark side of it because it might have lightning on the dark side of it. We think that it's somewhere between 10 and 20 times more massive than the Earth. And we haven't seen it? We can't see it? It's so far away that it's actually just at the edge of what our biggest telescopes on the ground can, can possibly see because it's so far away. 50 billion miles away. It's also hard to find because it has an enormous orbit. Planet Nine, we think, takes something like 15,000 years to go around the sun. Wait a minute, 15,000 years? 15,000 years. To make one orbit? One orbit. To search for Planet Nine, Brown goes up Mauna Kea, the big mountain on Hawaii's Big Island, to use the big telescope, the Subaru. Brown doesn't look directly through the telescope. He monitors pictures it's taking of the same sections of sky on successive nights, and then compares them 
hunting for movement. We have to very systematically look at every patch of sky here, 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 here. And what we're looking for is it's actually kind of simple. We take a picture one night, we come back the next night, all the stars, all the galaxies are in the same spot night after night after night. And Planet Nine, when we see it, will slowly move across the sky. And will look something like this. Brown's discovery 11 years ago that changed the way we think of the solar system. Using pictures from successive nights, Brown discovered this Pluto-sized object, which led to the demotion of lovable Pluto. You didn't love Pluto growing I, I, up? I loved Pluto. I was totally fascinated by Pluto. When I started in astronomy, I started looking at this region of the sky because I thought it was so interesting out there. When Pluto was first discovered, it was thought to be a, a, a big planet. You can go back and find the New York Times headline on the day that the discovery was announced, and it says, a ninth planet discovered in the outer solar system, uh, possibly larger than Jupiter. Jupiter's the biggest planet, but Pluto, it turned out, was no Jupiter. These are all the planets and other objects at their real relative sizes. This is Jupiter. Jupiter is huge compared to the other things. This is Jupiter. This is Saturn without its rings. Uranus, Neptune, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And at the very edge of the solar system, as we now think of it, is Pluto. It's only wrong by a factor of 50,000. So it went from being a monster planet to being a dwarf planet. A dwarf planet, one of many that are out there that are part of this region of the sky. This region is the Kuiper Belt at the edge of our solar system, a vast realm of frozen debris created during the birth of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. The Kuiper Belt keeps Brown up all night, hunting for discoveries. It's the most exciting thing I can think of doing. You know, it's not just that it's hard to stay up all night and so I force myself to do it. I am excited every night I go out there about what I might find. When Mike Brown found that Pluto-sized object, it was the biggest of a group of hundreds of Pluto-like objects recently discovered. So Brown wondered, should Pluto really be a planet? But demoting Pluto would mean that every textbook showing planets would have to be changed. That was fine with Brown, who believes planets must be significant and that the eight large planets are. Their strong gravitational fields control everything around them. Planets are the big bullies of the planetary system that, are, that basically ignore everybody else around them and everybody else has to deal with the planets. Those are what the planets are. And Pluto didn't fit that concept. Neptune controls Pluto's orbit. Neptune is the bully of that neighborhood. To resolve the issue, astronomers from all over the world gathered in Prague in 2006. The International Astronomical Union would decide whether to demote little Pluto or give planet status to hundreds of similar objects. 6A is concerned with Pluto and Pluto-like objects. Astronomers voted overwhelmingly to go down to eight planets, and Brown became known as the guy who killed Pluto. I think that's probably true. The Pluto vote was ill-timed for NASA. Just seven months before Pluto's demotion, NASA launched a mission to Pluto to learn about its surface and origins. Scientists are still analyzing spectacular pictures from NASA's flyby. They show Pluto's mostly icy surface and close-ups of craters. Now the spaceship is heading deeper into the Kuiper Belt. Although Pluto was demoted 10 years ago, Pluto lovers still send Brown hate mail and voicemail. He kept this one. Hey, Pluto's still a planet, you jackass. <laughs> Even Brown's 11-year-old daughter, Lila, didn't like what he had done to Pluto. What did you tell him that he should do to make up for that? Well, I told him that if he found a new planet, it might make up for the fact that he killed a planet, or a planet that everybody loved. Seems that he actually went out and did that. Yeah. What do you think of that? Um, it's really great. I'm very proud of him. <laughs> <laughs> She's referring to the huge Planet Nine we mentioned earlier. No one was more surprised by that discovery than Brown himself. 
Until recently, he believed our planets would only be the big eight. And we had explored so much of the solar system beyond those eight that if there were anything else like a planet, we would have found it. After all, NASA's spaceships have flown past every known planet, capturing pictures of Saturn's rings, the pockmarked surface of Mercury, the gassy atmosphere of Jupiter, and well beyond our solar system, the Hubble telescope is busy taking pictures of distant galaxies. NASA says this single image shows 10,000 galaxies. Other pictures show signs of black holes millions of light years away. And this one, a glimpse of stars being born. No wonder Brown had thought we'd found all our planets. So now you think there's another pretty big planet out there. Yeah, I am pretty dead certain that it's out there. What makes you think that? As we were studying these objects out beyond Neptune, Pluto and the other objects in the Kuiper Belt, but when you get to the most distant ones, they all look like they're being pulled off in one direction. And you think the thing that's pulling them is a big planet? Yes. Couldn't there be some other explanation? We, we tried many different explanations in trying to prove that it wasn't a planet. Nothing, nothing works. I am 100% convinced. Brown's partner, Konstantin Batygin, a planetary science professor at Caltech, came up with this mathematical proof. Proof, he says, that Planet Nine is pulling those remote objects in similar oblong orbits. It looks like mathematical gibberish to our untrained eye, but Batygin told us his equation melds 10 accepted formulas, and when coupled with more than 8,000 lines of computer code, it describes Planet Nine's orbit. So, he says, he doesn't have to see it to know it exists. The mathematics proves it. And it's like being, you know, downtown and hearing a an ambulance a few streets away. You haven't seen it, but your other senses provide you with the information that really this ambulance is really there. Here, instead of hearing it, you see it in the math. This is a roadmap to Planet Nine. Exactly. This, in the end, tells you where to look on the sky. To speed up the search, Batygin and Brown published their roadmap so other astronomers could join the hunt. Foremost among them is Scott Shepard of the Carnegie Institution. It was Shepard who first spotted the odd orbits in the Kuiper Belt that led Mike Brown to conclude there's a huge planet out there. Now Shepard, like Brown, compares the pictures taken on consecutive nights hoping to spot Planet Nine. We just uh, found some more uh, of small objects very far in the solar system that continue to show the trend that there should be a Planet Nine out there. Is it important to you whether you were the first to find it or another astronomer finds it. It would be great to be the first one to find it. It is a race. There's a lot of people looking for it. But uh, just to have it found is, is what we want. When do you think we might actually identify, spot, Planet Nine? I think that within three years, we will be able to cover that swath of sky that, that we need to cover. Is this giant Planet Nine the last planet we'll find in our solar system, or is, is there, there a, a planet, planet 10? 10? Yeah, we don't know. Planet 9 is already far enough away that it requires the biggest telescopes we have to find it. Planet 10 is even further. Planet 9 is, is our generation's planet. It's the perfect planet to find right now. Planet 10, this is when I talk to kids, I tell them, Planet 10, it's yours. Go, go find it. Now, the latest from Mars, thanks to NASA's incredibly sophisticated geologist, a one-ton rover named Curiosity that landed on Mars more than four years ago. Its biggest discovery so far is this. More than three billion years ago, Mars had all the building blocks necessary for life. Back then, Mars and Earth were very similar, wet, warm, and habitable. But as life evolved on Earth, Mars became cold, dry, and inhospitable. Did life ever exist on Mars? We don't know yet. But the rover Curiosity is on the hunt, 
and has been slowly maneuvering through a topographic treasure trove. Tonight, you'll see stunning pictures and hear what Curiosity is telling us about Mars and Earth. From Mars, Curiosity can barely see Earth more than 30 million miles away. But Curiosity is seeing Mars as never before, leaving its mark, its tracks, and sending back postcards of sand dunes 20 feet tall, extending for miles, ancient stone lake beds that have been dry for billions of years, and time-lapse pictures of a Martian sunset. Like any vain photographer, Curiosity poses for selfies along the way as she works to solve Mars' most challenging mysteries. So we're reading the rocks uh, with Curiosity. We're reading the rocks. We read the rocks. Katie Stack Morgan, a geologist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, helps decide what pictures Curiosity should take and where it should go. Hundreds of scientists and engineers support the rover. They can't drive it in real time from Earth because there's a 30-minute time lag to get a message to Mars and back. So Curiosity, shown in this NASA animation, gets its instructions beamed up at the start of each day. And the rover is such a talented geologist that it can teach us a lot from a single pebble fused into a bigger rock. There's a, a pebble right here, and it's actually quite round. And on Mars, round pebbles mean they used to be wet. And if you think about pebbles that you find in a stream on Earth, they tend to be very round as well. It's because as they move in the streams, pebbles are hitting other pebbles, and they round off all the little corners. That's how we know this deposit was formed in rushing water. I mean, this is the first evidence we have from the surface that water flowed across the surface of Mars. This NASA animation is based on Mars' actual surface. Curiosity's capabilities include a laser that zaps rocks up to 23 feet away to find out what they're made of. It's the first rover that can drill for samples of Mars and analyze them in its built-in lab. An early sample told us more about that water that used to be here and led to Curiosity's biggest find so far. The water that was on the surface of Mars, you could scoop it up and drink it. Rob Manning, so chief engineer at JPL, told us because the water was drinkable and because Curiosity also found essential organic chemicals, Mars could have supported life. Does that mean life was there? It doesn't. We don't know. You're talking about microbial life. Microbial single-cell organisms. But if you would look for today alive, it wouldn't be on the surface. You have to go underground, just like we have life on this planet, huge amounts of life living underground on this planet. Manning told us life might have traveled back and forth between Mars and Earth. When a meteor comes along and hits Mars, a, a rock from Mars can be lifted up, travel then f in circles around the sun until someday it will bump, it, bump into Earth and land in, say, Antarctica. Where a rock from Mars was discovered in 1984. Right. We found Mars rock. And we found them all over Earth. And the reverse is also true. Certainly, Earth rock with life in it has taken a trip to Mars. Could that life survive the trip? It's we split, believe what, 30 million miles? We don't know. We think life might be able to do that. Get ready. Here's the punchline. Could have been that Mars was habitable before Earth was, and life got its foothold on Mars and took its journey to Earth, and we're all Martians. You know how mind-blowing that is? But it's possible. Life is amazing. Mars could have been habitable when Earth wasn't. Because um, we're looking at rocks that are very, very old. How um, old? I mean, we're talking billions of years. Why is it that we can't find rocks here that are as old as on Mars? Most of Earth is constantly recycling um, as the plates on the surface move around. But here on Mars, we don't really have evidence for plate tectonics. Um, this is the Mars rock record of Mars history preserved at the surface. And that's a really unique opportunity to explore a time in the solar system uh, that may not be preserved on the surface of Earth. The scariest part of the entire mission was Curiosity's landing on Mars. 
It couldn't bounce onto Mars cushioned by giant airbags the way smaller rovers had. Curiosity weighs a ton, too big for the bags. So lead engineer Adam Stelzner and his team came up with a bizarre plan to pack Curiosity into a flying saucer, fire rockets to slow its descent, and then use long cables to lower it onto Mars. Many here thought they were crazy. The team recognized that if we failed, we would find no comfort or solace from the general public. There'd be a lot the, of fingers pointed. The man on the street says, that looks crazy. I could have told you it was crazy. And so I um, developed this little statement I would make before I'd even start. It goes like this. Great works and great folly may be indistinguishable at the outset. Because of the communication time lag, they could not direct the landing from Earth. The complex maneuvers were pre-programmed. Steltzner and his team could only wait and worry. We were just sitting in the control room, pacing back and nails. forth, trying to remember to breathe. Here's animation of the landing. And the actual reaction at mission control. Next shot confirmed. The team celebrated. And then sometime in the wee hours of the morning, I went home, crawled into bed with my wife, and wept because I was spent. I was overwhelmed. This is where Curiosity landed, the smudges on the left. They look like burn marks, but they're not. They're dust clearing marks. This is where the, the rockets cleared the dust away. I see a, a, a trail. That's right, so these are the tracks of the rover. So the rover landed here, um, and then it drove along, made a couple of How about that? turns, and you can actually see this from orbit, which is incredible. NASA's been sending satellites to Mars for more than 50 years. Three are orbiting Mars now, monitoring its weather and sending back images of giant craters wind-carved ridges, and an avalanche of sand pouring down a mountain kicking up huge clouds of dust. Down on the surface, one of the three earlier rovers continues to operate. Opportunity is just one-fifth the size of Curiosity. It can't scoop up samples or analyze the surface the way Curiosity can, but Opportunity has been snapping stunning pictures for 13 years while Curiosity's mission almost ended after just six months. We had had some sort of, the rover had some sort of memory problem. Rob Manning told us a computer glitch came within one hour of stopping communication with Curiosity forever. The rover has two identical computers called pilot and co-pilot. The pilot is supposed to have enough self-diagnosis and be smart enough to say, I'm not doing very well, I'm not feeling well. I'm gonna let the co-pilot take over. Yet pilot was not doing well and refused to give up control. In fact, it started acting a bit like it had an attitude. The Just computer had an attitude. The computers <laughs> developed an attitude in a way that we have never had never seen before. When we told it to go take a nap, it refused to take a nap. Yeah. Then it refused to take pictures. Then it refused to do more science throughout the day. And it, was like, it just stopped doing these things. I was like, what the heck is going on? And time is running out. Time is running out because in an hour, it's going to turn its radio off and stay off forever. And we'll lose this very expensive rover. Manning's team sent an order to kill the pilot, hoping that would force the co-pilot to take over. We're waiting for the co-pilot to wake up and then turn on its radio to let us know that it was alive. We should get a signal, nothing. Another minute goes by, nothing. Four minutes go by, now we're starting to get really worried. It sounds like a movie. It really was, you know, was getting nerve wracking. <laughs> and bing, there's the signal. And the backup pilot was obviously in charge. And so- The backup pilot's still in charge today? The backup pilot's still in charge. We have since repaired the bad pilot. To help direct the pilot, the Jet Propulsion Lab built its own patch of Mars, where they can practice maneuvers with the rover's twin. Adam Steltzner told us the rover can see where it's going and make mid-course corrections to avoid pitfalls. Why is she so slow? We are exploring. We don't want to miss anything. 
So she moves deliberately. So Katie Stack Morgan can study everything Curiosity sees. This is actually an active dune field. What do you mean by an active dune field? It means field? that the sand particles that are making up the dunes are still moving today. Being blown across <laughs> the, the landscape. They're very slowly um, being moved across the surface. Because of the Martian wind? Mm -hmm. so everybody we talk to talks about how studying Mars helps us better understand Earth. How so? When we look at rocks on Mars, we are potentially seeing a snapshot of, of our solar system at a time before Earth uh, developed its environment as we know it. It's really like we were there. Now Curiosity has started climbing partway up Mount Sharp. That's why it landed nearby. The mountain is a layer cake of history, each ascending layer revealing how Mars changed over time. The layers at the bottom, those are the older layers, and each successive layer uh, is younger and younger and younger. As you climb the mountain, what do you expect to find? What, what do you hope to find? We're actually expecting to, to see that transition when Mars transitioned from being a habitable planet to being one that was not habitable. What happened to the atmosphere of Mars to, to turn it into this almost dead planet? It cooled, it lost its magnetic field, the solar wind blew away its atmosphere, and so it dried out. It became a prune of its former self. We're still a plum, it's a prune. What does that Martian history tell us about Earth. I don't think we have to worry about drying out like Mars, but it does teach well, that's us. That's a relief. Right. But it does teach us of how delicate the balance mm. of our environment is. And so uh, it should heighten our appreciation of what a beautiful, warm, wet hug living here on Earth really is. For a long time, astronomers saw the asteroids and comets that come close to Earth as useless debris, space rocks that blocked our view of distant galaxies. Not anymore. They're now viewed as scientifically important and potentially very dangerous if they were to collide with our planet. The odds of that happening on any given day are remote, but over millions of years, scientists believe there have been lots of impacts, and few doubt there are more to come. A former astronaut told us it's like a game of cosmic roulette, and one mankind cannot afford to lose. Concern over our ability to detect these objects that come near the Earth grew after an incident in Russia this February, when an asteroid crashed into the atmosphere with many times the energy of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, narrowly missing a city of one million. This is video of that asteroid in Russia, barreling toward Earth at 40,000 miles an hour. It exploded into pieces 19 miles above and 25 miles south of the city of Chelyabinsk. People thought it had missed them entirely until minutes later when the shockwave arrived. Shattering glass, crushing doors, and knocking some people right off their feet. More than a thousand were injured. How much warning did people in Chelyabinsk have? None. Paul Chodis is a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. He and his boss, Don Yeomans, have been trying to track near-Earth objects for decades. We didn't see it coming. Uh, it was coming from the general direction of the sun, so it was in the daytime sky as it approached. So how did you find out about it? Twitter and YouTube, uh, when, we, when we first saw the images. So the first people at NASA heard about it was Twitter? <laughs> exactly. Chodis says an object this size hits Earth once every hundred years on average. Yet the same day, purely by chance, another asteroid twice as large came within 17,000 miles of Earth, passing between us and the satellites that are bringing you this broadcast. The only reason there was any advance warning was because an amateur astronomer in Spain, an oral surgeon by day, noticed it just before it moved out of view. We know about some of the most distant galaxies in the known universe and yet we don't really know everything that's right in our own backyard. Wow. Amy Mainzer is a NASA scientist who focuses on detecting asteroids. So we gotta move the dome out of the way, and then we're gonna to start to follow the asteroid as it tracks across the sky. 
This telescope at the Table Mountain Observatory in California is one of dozens all over the world that are used to track and study near-Earth objects. Mainzer told us they're often very hard to find. Some of these asteroids are really, really dark, darker even than coal in some cases, kind of like the soot at the bottom of a barbecue grill. So you're looking for something that's darker than coal against a black sky. Exactly. And now you see the problem. <laughs> Another problem is that ground-based telescopes can't see objects coming from the direction of the sun because they're in the daytime sky, like the asteroid that hit Russia. Astronomers find asteroids by taking repeated pictures of the night sky and looking for things that change position. Professionals and amateurs all over the world work together sharing information. Once Paul Chodis and his NASA colleagues have multiple sightings, they can predict an object's location as far as 100 years into the future. This particular object has a very well-known orbit. Because the asteroid Amy Mainzer was observing the night we visited didn't look like much on her screen. That little thing. Yep, that's it. But it's How nearly half a mile wide and capable of destroying an entire continent. So that's actually a, that's a huge asteroid. Yeah, it's a huge asteroid. If something this size hit the Earth, it would be devastating. It would be very bad. Asteroids are composed mostly of rock, comets, ice and dust. They come in all shapes and sizes. Some look like small planets, others giant dog bones. For a long time, nobody thought they were worth tracking at all. It wasn't thought that they really did hit the Earth. Astronomers debated for a long time about the nature of the craters on the moon. They and thought the craters on the moon were volcanic. Possibly, yeah. And it's only been fairly recently, within you know, the last 50 years or so, that the field has really recognized that, yeah, impacts actually do happen. And not only do they happen on geological timescales, you know, millions and billions of years, but on human timescales in some cases. The last major asteroid to collide with Earth hit in 1908 in the Tunguska region of Siberia. It's believed to have been 40 yards wide and to have exploded in the air like a nuclear bomb, leveling 80 million trees in an area the size of metropolitan Washington. This crater in northern Arizona was created 50,000 years ago. It's one of more than 180 impact craters geologists have found so far. They think there are many more, hidden by water and vegetation, more even than on the moon, because the Earth's gravity is greater. The most famous impact of all is the one that may have wiped out the dinosaurs more than 65 million years ago. The theory is that an enormous asteroid or comet collided so violently with Earth, it created a cloud of debris that blocked out the sun, killing off 75% of all species, and leaving behind a crater in Mexico more than 100 miles wide. These are objects that uh, were once in space, pieces of asteroids. Uh, Yeomans and Chodas showed us some of the remarkable things that have fallen from the sky. This is a piece of Mars. You have it in your hand. Yeah. It wandered around the inner solar system for a few million years, and a 40-pound stone came down in Africa about 10 feet from a farmer in uh, really? October of 1962. It's the, amazing uh, think this is from Mars. It's from, yeah, I know. They it's played a, a trick on me as well. Say, would you hand that one to me, that, that, that big one? Yeah. <laughs> Come, <fine. laughs> oh my God. This one was iron nickel and heavy as an anvil. Not all asteroids are made of such dense stuff, but many contain high concentrations of valuable minerals like platinum, that might someday be mined in space. We'll start by sending astronauts to an asteroid for the first time in history. President Obama's proposed budget for next year includes a plan to capture a tiny asteroid so that astronauts could rendezvous with it by 2025. The idea is to perfect techniques needed to explore deep space and perhaps find a way to exploit the water resources that many comets and asteroids have. You could extract water from them. You can break the water down into hydrogen and oxygen, which is the most efficient form of rocket fuel. So uh, asteroids may serve as the fueling stations and watering holes for future planetary exploration. But as the scriptwriters of the Hollywood blockbuster Armageddon vividly imagined, asteroids have the potential to harm mankind as well. For better or worse, this is what many of us know about near-Earth objects. That if Bruce Willis hadn't nuked one, it would have destroyed the world. You see these movies with Bruce Willis where an asteroid is coming and is going to destroy the world. Is that likely? No. <laughs> no. We found 95% uh, of the large ones, and none of them represent a threat in the next 100 years or so. What about the other 5%? We're still looking. 
He's talking about objects over half a mile wide that are big enough to cause global destruction. The problem is there are lots of smaller objects over 40 yards in diameter that are unaccounted for and potentially very dangerous. If you look at the light green dot, that's the orbit of the Earth. Ed Liu is a former astronaut who spent six months on the International Space Station. He showed us a computer-generated representation of our solar system. That's the sun in the center, and those green dots are 10,000 near-Earth objects astronomers have found so far. So these green dots are the asteroids that could hit the Earth. This is of the, the, about the, the 10,000 known asteroids. Yes, these are the 10,000 known asteroids. Here's the problem. There's about a factor of 100 more. The real solar system looks like this. And we know this because we've only been able to observe a small fraction of the sky, and we know that there's about 100 times more asteroids Wait, than we've Wait a minute, this found. is all the asteroids that are... There are about a million asteroids large enough to destroy a city out there. And right now we only know of, of what percent of those asteroids? About one half of one percent. Does it worry you that you only know one percent of these asteroids that are big enough to destroy a city? Well, most of those are really small, and the odds are that many of these would hit in a remote area or or it could hit in, in an ocean. So uh, that is why the larger ones are those that we were paying attention to first. Now, the next size range is the one to concentrate on, those that can cause you know, continent-wide extinction or, or d destruction. Yeah, th th that would be pretty good to That's prevent that <laughs> continent-wide destruction. <laughs> those are the next ones. We'll continue to find those, and we, and we work our way down to the small ones. But right now, an object that could wipe out the eastern seaboard or New York City could be a day away and there's a very good chance we wouldn't know about it. Well, we're working to make sure that we will know about it. But right now we wouldn't know about it. It's possible, yes. The Committee on Science, Space and Technology will come to order. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden faced similar questions from Congress after the near miss in Russia earlier this year. What would we do uh, if you detected uh, even a small one, uh, like the one that uh, detonated in, in, in Russia, um, headed for New York City in three weeks. What would we do? If it's coming in three weeks, uh, pray. Is there anything you can do to deflect an asteroid that's going to hit besides evacuating a city? If you find it 10 or 20 or 30 years in advance, then yes, uh, you could actually send a spacecraft up, uh, run into it, slow it down a millimeter or two per second so that in 10 or 20 years when it was predicted to hit the Earth, it wouldn't. Just slam a spacecraft just into it. Just slam into it. In 2005, NASA did just that as an experiment, firing a small unmanned spacecraft into a comet called Temple One. But you can't deflect what you don't detect, which is why former astronaut Ed Liu has taken on a new mission. Here's the telescope that we're building. He's now chairman of the B612 Foundation, which has designed a space-based telescope to speed up the discovery of near-Earth objects. NASA's Amy Mainzer has been developing one, too. Both telescopes would be able to find asteroids by using infrared sensors that detect heat rather than light. But a telescope like this would cost roughly half a billion dollars, and so far neither the United States nor any other government has committed significant funds. So the B612 Foundation is trying to raise the money privately by reaching out to individual donors. I don't think there's any other global uh, catastrophe, global scale catastrophe that we can prevent. This is the only one that I know of. We can solve this particular issue for the cost of building a freeway overpass. I mean, and that's literally what it is. But nobody has been killed by an asteroid. Yeah, and what I'm saying is that you can't wait to that point afterwards when you say we should have done it. You have to think of this as cosmic roulette, right? The phrase that they have in Vegas is that the house always wins. And, you know, the sort of secret to all this is that we're not the house. At some point, you know, the solar system's going to get you. They're very low probability events, but very high consequence events. The problem, it seems like, is you're asking people to care about something which may not affect their lives, may not even affect their children's lives. That's true. Mm -hmm. It's a tough concept to get across because as you say, it's uh, something that may not happen for another 100 years, 200 years. It may happen tomorrow morning.